Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring the Post Apocalypse. The Wheel is Death by Roger D. Aycock. Bridge Crossing by Dave Dreyfus. Regeneration by Charles Dye. To Pay the Piper by James Blish. In His Image by Bryce Walton. The Wheel is Death by Roger D. Aycock, writing as Roger D. Originally published in Planet Stories Fall 1949. Narrated by Tom Trussell. He was too late to stop them. Old Kalis dropped his upraised arm, and at his signal the four naked underpriests flung the bound body of Gorzan over the precipice. Ortho heard his friend's thin scream keening away until it dwindled in the distance, and the muted roar of the falls boiling at the cliff's bottom floated upward and drowned it. He turned to run but the horror of what he had seen numbed his limbs to nightmare slowness. Kaliz and the four underpriests caught him before he had taken a dozen steps. "'You are still a neophyte,' old Kaliz said gently. "'You have only begun to learn, and so you cannot understand why Gorzan had to die. The answer lies there,' he pointed a wrinkled hand at the valley below. Over the heads of the four priests who squatted on the ledge outside the priest cave, Ortho looked down into the valley, the lush green miles of its even floor clothed in a faint rosy haze of vapour. The sun sat red upon the western wall. Above the eastern rim the rising moon hung warm and turquoise blue, its great encircling ring pulsing like an aura of living light. Under its glow, the valley haze turned violet and then blue, and on the heels of its rising came the faint elfin voices of the people, leaving their caves to play in the meadow. Ortho sat back upon his polished sitting stone and met the high priest's eyes defiantly. "'There is no reason down there,' he said sullenly. "'It is only the people coming out to play under the moon.' You killed Gorzan because he was wiser than you, because he talked to the people and made clear to them things that they did not understand before. You were jealous of him, and you killed him lest he make your own wisdom seem small in the eyes of the people. Kaliz sighed and seated himself stiffly on his own sitting stone. The young do not learn easily, he said, but believe this, Ortho. Your friend Gorzan was a snare to the people, and a deadly menace to their way of life. We took him from them reluctantly, and only as a last resort, before he could start the people again on the bloody path of ambition, progress, and the machine. Ortho cupped his still beardless chin in his hands, and stared disconsolately down into the blue hazed valley where the people played. Empty talk, he said contemptuously. Priest talk. Ambition. Progress. The machine. I do not know the words. There is nothing but the valley and the people, who have always been and who will always be. Your words have no meaning. I have taught these others, Kaliz murmured. The blue moonlight pulsed warm across his wrinkled face, made his hooded eyes pools of reflected light. I can teach you, too. You would know these things soon, because you are almost ready to read the books. But I shall tell you now that you may not be rebellious for lack of understanding. He pointed again, this time at the moon with its restless blue halo. It was not always so, he said. 
His voice softened as his memory drifted back across the ages. Once it was yellow, pitted and airless and dead, shining only with the light reflected from the sun. Men changed that, as they changed the face of their world by the power of their science, which in the end defeated the aims they strove for and destroyed them almost utterly. The handful that remained of them found haven in the valley and began a new civilization, which is today the people. This time, being wiser, they outlawed the practice of science. Under Khaleesi's calm assurance, Ortho's resentment dwindled, and his loathing of the high priest gave way to bewilderment. "'Science?' he repeated. "'It is another strange word. I do not understand.' In another age, Gorzan would have been a scientist, Khalees said. I have seen them with my own eyes in the ancient days, puttering in tomb-like shops that shut other men away from them, denying all pleasure while they spent their lives improving what other scientists had already discovered. They were never satisfied, and in the end it was their insatiable lust for perfection that killed them that set the very moon aflame, and flung mankind back into the savagery from which it had risen. For there was a time, he went on somberly, shifting his sitting-stone to follow Orthos's troubled gaze down into the blue depths of the valley, long before my own, when men lived as simply as we, but without our peace and security. The world, then, was a savage place, full of frightful beasts which killed men for food because they were no more than weaker animals. Men, being weak and soft, sought communal safety in numbers and gained an advantage over the beasts because they developed intelligence and logic by exchanging ideas and experiences. They learned to use this intelligence to develop weapons which eventually wiped out all the dangerous beasts and made the world safe, but they were not content with safety, and fought savagely among themselves. Nations numbering millions of men came into being, and warred with each other, and with each war their ingenuity grew, and the deadliness of their weapons kept pace with their ingenuity. Khalees was quiet for a moment, listening to the faint laughter of the people that drifted up faintly from the valley floor. Men were not happy then, as they are now, he said. I remember them, Ortho, because I was one of them, and by a miracle escaped the great holocaust that destroyed mankind. Men had developed a weapon whose destructiveness was beyond the power of the mind to conceive, and it escaped control. Nation after nation died in a breath, Whole continents vanished under the impact of robot missiles whose explosions destroyed matter itself. One of these, perhaps by intent, struck the moon, and its reaction under the moon's lighter gravity set up a conflagration which never went out. Those of us who survived the Holocaust were greatly changed by the radiations of the explosions, and most of us soon died. I alone by chance, was rendered deathless. More ages I have passed than I can number, but I live on, perhaps eternally, to see that the people do not err and fall again into the trap with science with its machines would place in their way. Gorzan was a throwback to my own savage day, a natural scientist who believed nothing he was told and reasoned with a deadly logic that nothing created by nature can be perfect, but must be improved by the thought and effort of man. Today we slew him, reluctantly, because he had taken the final irrevocable step that branded him a heretic and an outlaw. Gorzan made a machine. He stretched out a hand to Ortho, and they rose together, the abashed eyes of the neophyte not meeting those of the high priest. 
Come, Khalees said, and behold the thing with your own eyes. I have kept it intact to convince you beyond doubt of Gorzan's heresy. They went back into the priest cave, past the long tiers of books, crumbling and yellow with age, to stand in awed silence over the thing Gorzan had made. Ortho stared, shivering, feeling the cold aura of unsentient alien power that radiated from the machine. It was a crude affair, built upon two wooden shafts that slanted upward to end in a pair of rough handles. Across them were lashed shorter sticks that supported a woven basket. At the forward end was a thin disc made of wooden segments, a little wooden axle running through the centre and holding the disc upright between the joined ends of the shafts. Gorzan, tired of making two trips to his cave with firewood and fruit, old Khalees said sombrely, so he created a machine which would carry a greater load than his shoulders would bear. In my own age the thing was called a wheelbarrow, but the name of it is not important now, because there will never be another. We will destroy it now, and with its destruction we will forget what Gorzan had rediscovered, which is the first principle of the machine that enslaved and then destroyed mankind, the wheel. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Bridge Crossing by Dave Dreyfus Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, May 1951 Narrated by Tom Trissel In 1849, the mist that sometimes rolled through the Golden Gate was known as fog. In 2149, it had become far more frequent and was known as smog. By 2349, it was fog again. But tonight, there was smoke mixed with the fog. Roddy could smell it. Somewhere in the forested ruins, fire was burning. He wasn't worried. The small blaze that smouldered behind him on the cracked concrete floor had consumed everything burnable within blocks. What remained of the gutted concrete office building from which he peered was fireproof. But Roddy was himself aflame with anger. As always, when invaders broke in from the north, he had been left behind with his nurse, Molly, while the soldiers went out to fight. And nowadays Molly's presence wasn't the comfort it used to be. He felt almost ready to jump out of his skin the way she rocked and knitted in that grated ruined chair, saying over and over again, The soldiers don't want little boys. The soldiers don't want little boys. The soldiers don't... I'm not a little boy, Roddy suddenly shouted. I'm a full-grown and I've never ever seen an invader. Why won't you let me go and fight? Fiercely, he crossed the bare, gritty floor and shook Molly's shoulder. She rattled under his jarring hand and abruptly changed the subject. A is for atom, B is for bomb, C is for corpse, she chanted. Roddy reached into her shapeless dress and pinched. Lately that had helped her over these spells. But this time, though it stopped the kindergarten song, the treatment only started something worse. Wasms hungry? Molly cooed, still rocking. Utterly disgusted, Roddy ripped her head off her neck. It was a completely futile gesture. The complicated mind that had cared for him and taught him speech and the alphabet hadn't made him a mechanic, and his only tool was a broken-handled screwdriver. He was still tinkering when the soldiers came in. While they lined up along the wall, he put Molly's head back on her neck. She gaped coyly at the new arrivals. 
Hello, boys, she simpered. Looking for a good time? Roddy slapped her to silence, reflecting briefly that there were many things he didn't know about Molly. But there was work to be done. Carefully he framed the ritual words she'd taught him. Soldiers, come to attention and report. There were eleven of them, six feet tall, with four limbs and eight extremities. They stood uniformly, the thumbs on each pair of hands touching along the centre line of the legs. Front feet turned out at an angle of forty-five degrees, rear feet turned inward at thirty degrees. Sir, they chorused, we have met the enemy and he is ours. He inspected them. All were scratched and dented, but one in particular seemed badly damaged. His left arm was almost severed at the shoulder. Come here, fellow, Roddy said. Let's see if I can fix that. The soldier took a step forward, lurched suddenly, stopped, and whipped out a bayonet. Death to invaders, he yelled, and charged crazily. Molly stepped in front of him. You aren't being very nice to my baby, she murmured, and thrust her knitting needles into his eyes. Roddy jumped behind him, knocked off his helmet, and pressed a soft spot on his conical skull. The soldier collapsed to the floor. Roddy salvaged and returned Molly's needles. Then he examined the patient, tearing him apart as a boy dismembers an alarm clock. It was lucky he did. The left arm's pair of hands suddenly writhed off the floor in an effort to choke him. But because the arm was detached at the shoulder and therefore blind, he escaped the clutching onslaught and could goad the reflexing hands into assaulting one another harmlessly. Meanwhile, the other soldiers left, except for one, apparently another casualty, who stumbled on his way out and fell into the fire. By the time Roddy had hauled him clear, damage was beyond repair. Roddy swore, then decided to try combining parts of this casualty with pieces of the other to make a whole one. To get more light for the operation, he poked up the fire. Roddy was new at his work and took it seriously. It alarmed him to watch the soldiers melt away, gradually succumbing to battle damage, shamed him to see the empty ruins burn section by section as the invaders repeatedly broke through and had to be burned out. Soon there would be nothing left of the private property keep-out that, according to Molly's bedtime story, the owners had entrusted to them when driven away by radioactivity. Soon the soldiers themselves would be gone. None would remain to guard the city but a few strayed servants like Molly and an occasional civil defender. And himself, Roddy reflected, spitting savagely into the fire. He might remain, but how he fitted into the picture he didn't know. And Molly, who claimed to have found him in the ruins after a fight with invaders twenty years before, couldn't or wouldn't say. Well, for as long as possible, Roddy decided, he'd do his duty as the others did theirs, single-mindedly. Eventually, the soldiers might accept him as one of themselves. Meanwhile, this newly attempted first aid was useful to them. He gave the fire a final poke, and then paused, wondering if, when heated, his screwdriver could make an unfastened end of wire stick on the greyish spot where it seemed to belong. Stretching prone to blow the embers hot so he could try out this new idea, Roddy got too close to the flames. Instantly the room filled with a stench of singed hair. Roddy drew angrily back, beating out the sparks in his uncut blonde mane. As he stood slapping his head and muttering, a deranged civil defence firefighter popped into the doorway and covered him with carbon dioxide foam. Roddy fled. His lifelong friends were not merely wearing out, they were unbearably wearing. In the street, even before he'd wiped off the foam, he regretted his flight. 
the fire was back home, and here, in the cold of his fog-shrouded canyon, a mere trail between heaped-up walls of rubble, the diaper he wore felt inadequate against the pre-dawn cold. His cherished weapon, a magnetic tack hammer, was chill beneath the diaper's top, and the broken radium-dialed wristwatch suspended from a string around his neck hung clammy against his chest. He stood irresolute on numbing bare feet, and considered returning to the more familiar bedlam. But colder than cold was his shame at being cold. Molly never was, though she knew how to keep him warm, nor were the others. Hunger, thirst, pain and coldness were sensations never experienced by his friends. Like the growth he'd been undergoing till recently, these were things of ignominy to be hidden as far as possible for inquiring eyes. Cold as it was, he'd have to hide. Temporarily, the darkness concealed him, though it was not quite complete. From above the fog, the moon played vaguely deceptive light on the splinters of architecture dooming toward it. Some distance off, an owl hooted, but here nocturnal rodents felt free to squeak and rustle as they scampered. The world seemed ghostly, yet it wasn't dead, it merely lurked, and as an irrepressible yawn reminded Roddy of his absurd need for sleep even in the midst of danger, he concluded for the thousandth time that the one who'd built him must have been an apprentice. For just such reasons he developed the hideout toward which he now walked. It had been the haven of his adolescence, when the discovery of how much he differed from his friends had been a shock, and the shock itself a difference to be hidden. His hiding place was a manhole, dead centre in the dead street. A weathered bronze bar, carefully placed in the cover's slotted rim, was a levering key that opened its door. Everything was wrong tonight. He couldn't even find the bar. Of course, that spoiled things, because the bar was a roller on which to move the heavy cover from below, and a support that held it ajar for ventilation. But the example of his friends had taught him above all else to carry out every purpose. Molly was a nurse. She had raised him despite all obstacles. The soldiers were guards, they protected the ruins against everything larger than a rat. The firefighter had put even him out when he was aflame. Anyhow, the manhole cover had been loosened by his frequent handling. He lifted it aside by main strength, then flattened himself to the street, and felt with his feet for the top rung. Halfway down the iron ladder, something made him pause. He looked but saw only blackness. He listened, sniffed, found nothing. What could have entered through the iron cover? He sneered at his own timidity and jumped to the bottom. It was warm. The dry bottom of the hole had the temperature of body heat, as if a large animal had recently rested there. Quickly Roddy drew the hammer from his waist. Then, with weapon ready for an instantaneous blow, he stretched his left hand through the darkness. He touched something warm, softish. Gingerly he felt over that curving surface for identifying features. While Roddy investigated, by touch, his long fingers were suddenly seized and bitten. At the same time, his right shin received a savage kick and his own retaliatory blow was checked in mid-swing by an unexpected voice. "'Get your filthy hands off me!' it whispered angrily. "'Who do you think you are?' Startled, he dropped his hammer. "'I'm Roddy,' he said, squatting to fumble for it. "'Who do you think you are?' "'I'm Ida, naturally. Just how many girls are there in this raiding party?' His first invader, and he had dropped his weapon." Scrabbling fearfully in the dust for his hammer, Roddy paused suddenly. This girl, whatever that was, seemed to think him one of her own kind. 
there was a chance, not much, but worth taking to turn delay to advantage. Maybe he could learn something of value before he killed her. That would make the soldiers accept him. He stalled, seeking a gambit. How would I know how many girls there are? Half expecting a blow, he got instead an apology. I'm sorry, the girl said. I should have known. Never even heard your name before, either. Roddy. Whose boat did you come in, Roddy? Boat. What was a boat? How would I know? he repeated, voice tight with fear of discovery. If she noticed the tension, she didn't show it. Certainly her whisper was friendly enough. Oh, you're one of the fellows from Bodega, then. They shoved a boy into our boat at the last minute, too. Tough, wasn't it, getting separated in the fog and tide like that? If only we didn't have to use boats. But, say, how are we going to get away from here? I wouldn't know, Roddy said, closing his fingers on the hammer and rising. How did you get in? Followed your footprints. It was sundown, and I saw human tracks in the dust, and they led me here. Where were you? Scouting around, Roddy said vaguely. How did you know I was a man when I came back? Because you couldn't see me, silly. You know perfectly well these androids are heat-sensitive and can locate us in the dark. Indeed, he did know. Many times he had felt ashamed that Molly could find him whenever she wanted to, even here in the manhole. But perhaps the manhole would help him now to redeem himself. "'I'd like to get a look at you,' he said. The girl laughed self-consciously. "'It's getting grey out. You'll see me soon enough.' But she'd see him, Roddy realised. He'd have to talk fast. "'What'll we do when it's light?' he asked. "'Well, I guess the boats have gone,' Ida said. "'You could swim the gate, I guess. "'You seem tall and strong enough. "'But I couldn't. "'You'll think it's crazy, but I've given this some thought, "'and even looked it over from the other side. "'I expect to try the Golden Gate Bridge.' "'Now he was getting somewhere. "'The bridge was ruined, impassable. Even her own people had crossed the strait by other means. But if there were a way over the bridge— "'It's broken,' he said. "'How in the world can we cross it?' "'Oh, you'll find out if you take me up there. I—I I don't want to be alone, Roddy. Will you go with me, now?' Well, she could be made to point out the route before he killed her, if nothing happened when she saw him. Uneasy, Roddy hefted the hammer in his hand. A giggle broke the pause. "'It's nice of you to wait and let me go first up the ladder,' the girl said. "'But where the heck is the rusty old thing?' "'I'll go first, said Roddy. "'He might need the advantage. "'The ladder's right behind me.' He clambered with hammer in teeth, and stretched his left hand from street level to grasp and neutralise the girl's right. Then, nervously fingering his weapon, he stared at her in the thin grey dawn. She was short and lean, except for roundnesses here and there. From her shapeless doe-skin dress stretched slender legs that tapered to feet that were bare, tiny, and like her hands, only two in number. Roddy was pleased. They were evenly matched as to members, and that would make things easy when the time came. He looked into her face. It smiled at him, tanned and ruddy, with a full mouth and bright dark eyes that hid under long lashes when he looked too long. Startling, those wary eyes, concealing. For a moment he felt a rush of fear, but she gave his hand a squeeze before twisting loose and bursting into sudden laughter. Diapers, she chortled, struggling to keep her voice low. My big, strong, blonde and blue-eyed hero goes into battle wearing diapers and carrying only a hammer to fight with. You're the most unforgettable character I've ever known. He'd passed inspection then, so far. He expelled his withheld breath and said, I think you'll find me a little odd in some ways. 
"'Oh, not at all,' Ida replied quickly. "'Different, yes, but I wouldn't say odd.' When they started down the street, she was nervous, despite Roddy's assertion that he knew where the soldiers were posted. He wondered if she felt some of the doubt he had tried to conceal, shared his visions of what the soldiers might do if they found him brazenly strolling with an invader. They might not believe he was only questioning a prisoner. Every day his friends were becoming more unpredictable. For that very reason, because he didn't know what precautions would do any good, he took a chance and walked openly to the bridge by the most direct route. In time, this apparent assurance stilled Ida's fears, and she began to talk. Many of the things she said were beyond his experience and meaningless to him, but he did note with interest how effective the soldiers had been. "'It's awful,' Ida said. So few young men are left, so many casualties. But why do you, we, keep up the fight? Roddy asked. I mean, the soldiers will never leave the city. Their purpose is to guard it, and they can't live, so they won't attack. Let them alone, and there will be plenty of young men. Well, said Ida sharply, you need indoctrination. Didn't they ever tell you that the city has a home, even if the stupid androids do keep us out? Don't you know how dependent we are on these rays for all our tools and things? She sounded suspicious. Roddy shot of a furtive, startled glance. But she wasn't standing off to fight him. On the contrary, she was too close for both comfort and combat. She bumped him hip and shoulder every few steps, and if he edged away, she followed. He went on with his questioning. Why are you here? I mean, sure, the others are after tools and things, but what's your purpose? Ida shrugged. I'll admit no girl has ever done it before, she said, but I thought I could help with the wounded. That's why I have no weapon. She hesitated, glanced covertly up at him, and went on with a rush of words. It's the lack of men, I guess. All the girls are kind of bored and hopeless, so I got this bright idea and stowed away on one of the boats when it was dark and the fog had settled down. Do you think I was being silly? No, but you do seem a little purposeless. In silence they trudged through a vast area of charred wood and concrete foundations on the northern end of the city. Thick fog over the water hid Alcatraz, but inshore visibility was better and they could see the beginning of the bridge approach. A stone rattled nearby. There was a clink of metal. Ida gasped and clung to Roddy's arm. "'Behind me!' he whispered urgently. "'Get behind me and hold on!' He felt Ida's arms encircling his waist, her chin digging into his back below the left shoulder. Facing them, a hundred feet away, stood a soldier. He looked contemptuous, hostile. "'It's all right,' Roddy said, his voice breaking. There was a long, sullen, heart-stopping stare. Then the soldier turned and walked away. Ida's grip loosened, and he could feel her sag behind him. Roddy turned and held her. With eyes closed, she pressed cold blue lips to his. He grimaced and turned away his head. Ida's response was quick. "'Forgive me,' she breathed, and slipped from his arms. But she held herself erect. "'I was so scared, and then we've had no sleep, no food or water.' Roddy was familiar with these signs of weakness, proud of appearing to deny his own humiliating needs. "'I guess you're not as strong as me,' he said smugly. "'I'll take care of you. Of course we can't sleep now.' but I'll get food and water. Leaving her to follow, he turned left to the ruins of a supermarket he had previously visited, demonstrating his superior strength by setting a pace Ida couldn't match. By the time she caught up with him, he had grubbed out a few cans of the special size that Molly always chose. Picking two that were neither dented, swollen, nor rusted, he smashed an end of each with his hammer, and gave Ida her choice of strained spinach or squash. "'Baby food!' she muttered. 
Maybe it's just what we need, but to eat baby food with a man wearing a diaper. Tell me, Roddy, how did you happen to know where to find it? Well, this is the northern end of the city, he answered, shrugging. I've been here before. Why did the soldier let us go? This watch, he said, touching the radium dial. It's a talisman. But Ida's eyes had widened, and the colour was gone from her face. She was silent, too, except when asking him to fill his fast-emptied can with rainwater. She didn't finish her own portion, but lay back in rubble with feet higher than her head, obviously trying to renew her strength. And when they resumed their walk, her sullen, fear-clouded face showed plainly that he'd given himself away. But to kill her now, before learning how she planned to cross the supposedly impassable bridge, seemed as purposeless and impulsive as Ida herself. Roddy didn't think, in any case, that her death would satisfy the soldiers. With new and useful information to offer, he might join them as an equal at last. But if his dalliance with his enemies seemed pointless, not even Molly's knitting needles could protect him. He was sure the soldiers must be tracking the mysterious emanations of his watch dial, and had trouble to keep from glancing over his shoulder at every step. But arrival at the bridge approach ended the need for this self-restraint. Here, difficult going demanded full attention. He'd never gone as far as the bridge before, not having wanted to look as if he might be leaving the city. The approach was a jungle of concrete with an underbrush of reinforcing steel that reached for the unwary with rusted spines. Frequently they had to balance on cracked girders an inch over roadless spots high off the ground. Here Ida took the lead. When they got to where three approach roads made a clover leaf, she led him down a side road and into a forest. Roddy stopped and seized her arm. "'What are you trying to do?' he demanded. "'I'm taking you with me,' Ida said firmly. "'Taking you where you belong.' "'No,' he blurted, drawing his hammer. "'I can't go, nor let you go. I belong here.' Ida gasped, twisted loose, and ran. Roddy ran after her. She wasn't so easily caught. Like a frightened doe, she dashed in and out among the trees, leaped to the bridge's underpinnings where they thrust rustedly from a cliff, and scrambled up the ramp. Roddy sighed and slowed down. The pavement ended just beyond the cable anchors. From there to the south tower, only an occasional dangling support wire showed where the actual bridge had been suspended. Ida was trapped. He could take his time, let the soldiers come up, as they undoubtedly would, to finish the job. But Ida didn't seem to realise she was trapped. Without hesitation, she dashed up the main left-hand suspension cable and ran along its curved steel surface. For a moment, Roddy thought of letting her go, letting her run up the ever-steepening catenary until, because there were no guard ropes or hand grips, she simply fell. That would solve his problem. Except it wouldn't be his solution. Her death wouldn't prove him to his friends. He set out quickly, before Ida was lost to sight in the thick fog that billowed in straight from the ocean. At first he ran erect along the top of the yard-wide cylinder of twisted metal, but soon the curve steepened. He had to go on all fours, clinging palm and sole. Blood was on the cable where she'd passed. More blood stained it when he'd followed. But because his friends knew neither pain nor fatigue, Roddy would admit none either. Nor would he give in to the fear that dizzied him at every downward look. He scrambled on like an automaton, watching only his holes till he rammed Ida's rear with his head. She had stopped, trembling and gasping. Roddy clung just below her and looked dazedly around. 
there was nothing in sight but fog, pierced by the rapier of rusted wire supporting them. Neither end of it was in sight. Upward lay success if death were not nearer on the cable. No soldier had ever come even this far, for soldiers, as he told Ida, never left the city, were not built to do so. But he was here. With luck he could capitalise on the differences that had plagued him so long. "'Go on,' he ordered hoarsely. "'Move!' There was neither answer nor result. He broke off an end of loosened wire and jabbed her rear. Ida gasped and crawled on. Up and up they went, chilled, wet, bleeding, pain-racked, exhausted. Never had Roddy felt so thoroughly the defects of his peculiar non-mechanical construction. Without realising it, he acquired a new purpose, a duty as compelling as that of any soldier or fire-watcher. He had to keep that trembling body of his alive, mount to the tall rust-tower overhead. He climbed, and he made Ida climb, till, at nightmare's end, the fog thinned, and they came into clear, wind-swept air and clawed up the last hundred feet to sanctuary. They were completely spent. Without word or thought they crept within the tower, huddled together for warmth on its dank steel deck, and slept for several hours. Roddy awoke as Ida finished struggling free of his unconscious grip. Limping, he joined her painful walk around the tower. From its openings they looked out on a strange and isolated world. To the north, where Ida seemed drawn as though by instinct, Mount Tamil Pace reared its brushy head, a looming island above a billowy white sea of fog. To the south were the twin peaks, a pair of buttons on a cotton sheet. Eastward lay Mount Diablo, bald and brooding, tallest of the peaks and most forbidding. But westward, over the ocean, lay the land of gold. Of all the kinds of gold there are, from brightest yellow to deepest orange, only a small portion of the setting sun glared above the fog bank. The rest seemed to have been broken off and smeared around by a child in love with its colour. Fascinated, Roddy stared for minutes, but turned when Ida showed no interest. She was intent on the tower itself. Following her eyes, Roddy saw his duty made suddenly clear. Easy to make out, even in the fading light, was the route by which invaders could cross to the foot of this tower on the remaining ruins of the road, climb to where he now stood, and then descend the cable over the bridge's gap and catch the city unaware. Easy to estimate was the advantage of even this perilous route over things that scattered on the water and prevented a landing in strength. Easy to see was a need to kill Ida before she carried home this knowledge. Roddy took the hammer from his waist. "'Don't! Oh, don't!' Ida screamed. She burst into tears and covered her face with scratched and bloodied hands. Surprised, Roddy withheld the blow. He had wept as a child, and weeping had for the first time learned he differed from his friends. Ida's tears disturbed him, bringing unhappy memories. "'Why should you cry?' he asked comfortingly. "'You know your people will come back to avenge you and will destroy my friends.' "'But, but my people are your people too!' Ida wailed. "'It's so senseless, now, after all our struggle to escape. Don't you see? Your friends are only machines built by our ancestors. We are men!' and the city is ours, not theirs. It can't be, Roddy objected. The city surely belongs to those who are superior, and my friends are superior to your people, even to me. Each of us has a purpose, though, while you invaders seem to be aimless. Each of us helps preserve the city, 
You only try to rob and end it by destroying it. My people must be the true men, because they're so much more rational than yours, and it isn't rational to let you escape. Ida had turned up her tear-streaked face to stare at him. Rational? What's rational about murdering a defenceless girl in cold blood? Don't you realise we're the same sort of being, we two? Don't, don't you remember how we've been with each other all day? She paused. Roddy noticed that her eyes were dark and frightened, yet somehow soft, over scarlet cheeks. He had to look away, but he said nothing. "'Never mind,' Ida said viciously. "'You can't make me beg. Go ahead and kill. See if it proves you're superior. My people will take over the city regardless of you and me, and regardless of your jumping-jack friends too. Men can accomplish anything.' Scornfully, she turned and looked toward the western twilight. It was Roddy's turn to stand and stare. "'Purpose!' Ida flung at him over her shoulder. "'Logic! Women hear so much of that from men. You're a man, all right. Men always call it logic when they want to destroy. Loyalty to your own sort, kindness, affection. All emotional, aren't they? Not a bit logical. Emotion is for creating, and it's so much more logical to destroy, isn't it?' She whirled back toward him, advancing as if she wanted to sink her teeth into his throat. "'Go ahead. Get it over, if, if you have the courage.' It was hard for Roddy to look away from that wrath-crimsoned face. It was even harder to keep staring into the blaze of her eyes. He compromised by gazing out and opening at the gathering dusk. He thought for a long time before he decided to tuck his hammer away. "'It isn't reasonable to kill you now,' he said. "'Too dark. You can't possibly get down that half-ruined manway tonight, so let's see how I feel in the morning.' Ida began to weep again, and Roddy found it necessary to comfort her, and by morning he knew he was a man. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past, and now for the next story. Regeneration by Charles Dye Originally published in Future Combined with Science Fiction Stories, September 1951. Narrated by Tom Trusser. It was bound to happen sooner or later. Not because man failed to understand his fellow man, but because he failed to understand himself. There wasn't much left afterwards. After the golden showers of deadly dust and the blinding flashes that blotted out the light from the sun. And all because man continued to confuse emotion with reason. But somehow, as before, man survived. Don't touch! Sinzor's command shot through the chill morning air like an arrow. The ragged little group of men stopped dead in their tracks and looked questioningly at the leader. He was pointing down to an object lying half buried in the soil at his feet. Another death thing, maybe, Sinzo said. Another thing our ancestors made which wit to destroy themselves. He peered around the semicircle of men until he spotted the aged one with a leg missing. Morge, see that this place is marked forbidden. The hunting party moved on, and Morge stayed behind. He hobbled about, collecting sticks and stones, arranging them in the forbidden symbol, way to form a barrier around the thing. It was because of such a thing that he had lost a leg in his youth. He both hated and feared the death things his ancestors had so carelessly left lying about before they vanished. But that wasn't right. Morge scratched his grisly old head and thought hard. According to Builder, wisest of their tribe, their ancestors hadn't all vanished. Some of them had become the tribe, Sinzo, Builder, and even old Morge. Very puzzling. But it was all because of the death things. Puffing, Morge completed the barrier, 
then turned for a last look at the thing gleaming dully in the pale winter sunlight. How strange it looked! In no way did it resemble the usual death things, most of which were long and round, with little wings attached. This one was different, like nothing he'd ever seen before. It was box-like, with strange arms sticking up, and under the arms, half-buried, was a shelf or platform, resembling vaguely the upper portion of two legs. The thing terrified Morge for a moment. Then, in order to prove his courage to himself, he stepped forward and spat on it. Nothing happened. Sneering, he spat on it again, and watched his spittle slowly run down its side over a strange marking like a thunderbolt. Thunderbolt! Suddenly Morge fell grovelling to his one good knee. It was Thor, god of thunder and lightning and god of the tribe, and he had spat on Thor. For nearly an hour he knelt there, praying forgiveness for his sacrilege. Then, trembling, he tore off a piece of his goatskin and wiped the spittle off Thor's side, carefully began to uncover the remainder of Thor. Finally, he lifted Thor out of the hole and onto level ground. Kneeling once more, he took a small drink scoop from his belt and placed it before Thor. Then he pulled out his knife and folded his single leg under him. Bending over, he cut a gash in his wrist and let the blood flow into the scoop until it was nearly full. Rising to his knee, he said, "'O oh, Thor, please take this humble offering to show that I am forgiven.' Almost prostrate now, he picked up the scoop and placed it on Thor's lap beneath his arms. Immediately there was a soft rumble and humming. Fearfully old Morge watched Thor's arms come down, lift up the scoop and carry it inside his huge mouth. There was a sucking noise and the scoop was returned empty to his lap. Filled with joy, Morge spent another endless time thanking Thor. Then all of a sudden an idea seized him. What if he carried Thor back to the tribe and presented him to the priest Thogor, for all to worship and give sacrifices to? Would not he, the despised, the looked down upon, be the greatest of heroes? All that was known of Thor were the legends, but at last they would have the actual god. Painfully, with many grunts and groans, he got Thor under one arm and staggered off towards the village, his crutch kicking up little puffs of dust. Builder was having trouble with Thaugor. He almost wished now that he had continued his search a little longer for a segment of humanity. He might have found a group less primitive who would have appreciated and understood his help much better. But this was the best he'd found. As it was, he had wandered over the continent nearly a lifetime before even finding these poor wretches. But they were at least human, something that couldn't be said for those others he'd come in contact with all through the past years. And now, after having been with a tribe, the only human tribe, for over a year, he was being balked by this priest which meant being balked at setting up truth and knowledge as the only true gods of humanity, being balked at getting the dam built before the spring rains, so that there would not be another summer drought, followed by a winter of famine such as they had just passed through. The dam was his first big project. Without freedom from want, there would be little progress next winter. Almost savagely he turned on Thaugor. But why must you have this religious festival now? Because of the finding of the god Thor, came Thaugor's cold answer. Why the offerings of blood? Can't they wait? The dam must be finished before the rains, but the loss of blood already has so weakened the workers that they can no longer work for a full day. Which is more important, worldly or spiritual things? Thaugor replied. But there maybe won't be anyone around to indulge in spiritual things if there's another drought this year. Thought will see to it that there is not another drought. Yes, I know, but wouldn't it be wiser to be on the safe side? Suppose somebody does something to displease Thor. 
"'Nobody will displease Thor. It is my duty to see to that. I tell them what to think, so that they won't displease Thor.' "'A crafty devil you are,' Builder thought, manipulating this image of Thor you talk about, so that it will take the blood-offerings of the people, and even you and that half-baked discipline of yours, Morge. "'It must look at your god Thor one of these days.' He suddenly felt very weary, and sat down on the floor. Looking up at Thaugor, he said, "'But that is not part of being civilised, to tell the people what to think. You must make them think without telling them what to think. And with the dam, next winter there will be freedom from want for the first time. The tribe will have a chance to think and be on the road to civilization. "'The tribe has already found civilization by finding Thor.' By worshipping him as a group, they have already ceased their bickering and quarrelling. Does not that fit in with your definition of civilization, the one you gave my people when it first came to us? Since the coming of Thor, we have begun to cooperate, have we not? No, hardly at all. I said civilization is cooperation among men in adapting to environment, which includes man. The two men stared at each other, and for a while there was silence. Nevertheless, Thaugor finally said, Thor and blood offerings continue. Builder watched Thaugor turn and stalk out of the tiny hovel that housed his plans and his work, himself and his dreams. What could he do? He could only appeal to the tribe's reason. Thaugor could appeal to their emotions, which were far stronger. But unless emotion was controlled, used wisely, there could never be any reason. Builder realised, with a sinking heart, he was much too old for the job he'd undertaken. Too late in life had he discovered these people. Almost all his energy since his youth had been sapped just looking for a segment of humanity. His mother and father had told him there might be failure, but still they had taught him everything they could in the short time before death had overtaken them. They had been the only humans living in that towering jungle of concrete and steel. How they had gotten there was never explained to him. It didn't matter, though. Suddenly Builder shook himself. Here he was recollecting his youth instead of concentrating on the task at hand. He must really be getting old. He was glad of Thaugor's visit. At least he was now fully aware of the problem to be solved. In spite of the priest, he had to find a way of getting that dam finished, and soon. Or maybe next year there wouldn't be any people, for game was getting scarcer each winter. Very little work was done that day, in spite of builders managing to round up his full crew. The blood offering each worker had given the night before had left them tired and listless. Only four of the fifty-four moles running across the river were filled with sand and gravel that morning and afternoon. There were still nearly fifty to be filled. Builder was very depressed. But he was even more depressed when at the close of day two workmen grew careless and slipped into the last mould being filled. Their ear-splitting shrieks brought half the tribe up over the hill above the village and down to the dam site. After Builder explained what had happened, there were angry mutterings to the effect that Thor was displeased with the dam, and therefore had taken lives. Nothing Builder could say would dissuade them from this notion. So well had Thaugor indoctrinated them with a religious fear of anything used to control nature. Builder hadn't realised until that moment just how much the people were against the dam. Then he saw Thaugor, tall and ominous in his cloak of black skins, come striding through the crowd. For a moment he stood facing them with his hands on his hips. There seemed to be a silent understanding between them. Slowly the crowd turned and disappeared over the hill. Then Thaugor strode over to Bilder and said simply, "'There will be no more damn.' Turning, he followed the rest of the tribe back to the village. Builder was thunderstruck. He knew there was no use arguing or trying to reason with either Thaugor or the tribe. There was too late for that. 
Only some drastic measure would complete the dam now. He walked tiredly over the black hill and down to his shack, wondering how he could compete with an idol. He realised now it had been foolish of him to have overlooked the possible effect Thor might have had upon the tribe. When it had been found three months ago, he never dreamed they would spend all their leisure in rituals. The god was his problem, therefore he must get it out of the way, himself, without expecting help from anyone. Each evening the clouds on the northern horizon were darkening and drawing closer. It was night when Builder finally stumbled into his quarters. After lighting a pine torch, he sat down by his workbench and buried his head in his hands. He was too tired and upset to eat, which was just as well. Outside of deliberately killing Thaugor, there was only one thing he could do, and that was to kidnap Thor. With this realisation, in spite of the risk involved, came some peace of mind. He hadn't the vaguest idea of just how he was to go about it, especially since his strength was failing him, but do it he would. First, though, he would have to wait until sometime before dawn, when everybody, even Thaugor, was sure to be asleep. The hours dragged heavily between then and his chosen time. Many were the times when he longed for something to read, although he supposed that by this time he'd forgotten how. Like wisps of smoke, memories of his youth in the concrete jungle drifted through his mind. How long ago that all seemed now. Sometimes he wondered if any of it had been real. But here he was, as his parents had wished him to be, trying to help what was left of humanity back up the trail. To what, he wondered, to destruction again, this time probably complete and final. He shook his old head and ran a trembling hand through his white shaggy hair. He'd gotten this far. Somehow he would get the rest of the way. Builder got up and crossed over to his sleeping pile. After tying several skins together, he folded them under his arm and walked out in the pre-dawn night. His bones felt the crackling cold of early spring as they never had felt it before. Slowly he made his way around the village to where Thor was housed under a huge slanting roof of bark and scraped skins. He had never seen Thor, and now wished he had paid at least one visit to the god. Like a shadow, he glided carefully through the blackness in back of the temple, until he was just inside the rear opening. He could see clear across the chamber, out into the pale, twinkling stars. Then he detected a dark mass in the centre of the temple, silhouetted against the stars. That must be Thor. Swiftly Builder advanced towards it, until his foot struck something soft, causing him to some stumble and fall. As he did so, he heard a grunt something that someone had been kicked in the stomach. Then something was on top of him, pounding his head and shoulders with a heavy stick of some kind. Old Builder knew he didn't have the strength to wrestle. He managed to get his pile of skins unfolded, and with his last ounce of strength throw them over the head of his attacker. Somehow he managed to wiggle out from underneath and climb to his feet. His assailant began to scream for help, but the heavy skins muffled his shouts. Quickly, Builder looked around for something to hit him with. The only thing his eye spotted was the idol. He hobbled over and, using both arms, dragged it off its dais. Then, with the remainder of his strength, dropped it squarely on top of whomever was under the skins. There was a muted clunk, followed by silence. Fearfully, Builder stood there for a moment, catching his breath and listening for anyone coming. All was quiet, except the pounding of his heart. As fast as he could make his arms and hands work, he rolled up the body in the skins and painfully hoisted it over one shoulder. With his other hand, he pe reached down and picked Thor up by one of its arms, then staggering under the load, he started back the way he had come. Except for a greyish streak in the east, it was still dark. He stumbled and fell several times before reaching his dwelling 
but he was confident that he had left no tracks. Every night, even this late in the winter, the ground froze solid. Back inside his shed, still in the dark, Builder unrolled his burden and listened for any heartbeat. There was none. As he rolled the body up again, something clattered to the floor. It was a crutch. Quickly he felt for his victim's legs. One was missing. Of all the people he had to kill, Morge, Thaugor's right-hand man. He realised he had to get rid of the body before daylight and fast. Already more grey was lining the eastern horizon. He didn't know whether he had the strength to do it or not, but he had to get Morge up to the dam and into one of the unfilled moulds. For the time being, he would have to hide Thor someplace inside here. He couldn't carry both of them up to the dam. He rolled the idol up in another set of skins and placed it under the head of his sleeping pile. Then, picking up his other bundle once more, he started for the dam. The sun was just peeking over the horizon when Builder finally stumbled back into his dwelling and into bed. All that day he lay there, body on fire with fever and heart pounding like a drum. He was almost certain he will soon die. It was just as well, a little corner of his consciousness said. At least he would be missing all the frenzied excitement of Thor's disappearance along with Morge. But it looked as though he had failed after all. In spite of removing the god, now he was dying, and the dam still unfinished. The day dragged on and on, and he didn't die. After waking up in late afternoon, he felt better. He ate a handful of nuts and figs washed down with a little herb tea. Then as night crept over the sky, he tottered down to the village. Whatever had taken place during the day was done, and little groups of people stood around fires resting and talking, as though it were the old days before the coming of Thor, thought Builder. That was good. Builder moved in closer to one of the fires to warm himself against the early spring night. Someone recognised him. It was one of his workers, and was suddenly made welcome, once again being given the place of honour nearest the fire, as in the old days when he'd first discovered the humans. Builder was dumbfounded at the sudden cordiality. In recent days, Thaugor had done such a good job of discrediting he never dreamed of regaining his old standing. Then he was told what had happened during the day while he lay most dying. When the god and Morge were discovered missing, Thaugor had called the village together, explaining that Thor had left them, taking Morge as a sacrifice because he was dissatisfied with the tribe's paltry blood offerings and worship. Therefore, a great death sacrifice of young men and women must be undertaken to pacify Thor, and cause his return. But the people questioned Thaugor's order. They seemed to feel it was the priest who had been at fault, not themselves. After all, he was the closest to Thor, was he not? Therefore it was Thaugor, not the village that Thor had become angered at. And after holding quick counsel, they had driven Thaugor out into the wilderness, telling him he was not to return unless Thor was with him. Old Builder almost cried when he heard this joyful news. The dam would be completed after all, he was almost certain. He decided to say nothing more about religion, Thor or Thaugor. Maybe soon they would forget the whole thing. Now he could go back to teaching the youngsters and some of the brighter oldsters the methods of writing in symbols instead of drawing pictures. Hours and days turned into weeks and months as Builder taught his people what feeble knowledge he possessed in arithmetic, simple engineering, such as the dam, and most of all, instilling in them the will to want to learn and investigate and question anything they came in contact with, even the very thing he was asking them to do. As the weeks passed on and the dam was completed, 
he gradually gathered around him an ardent little group of seeker after what the most elusive of all things, the truth. But Builder knew that his days were numbered now, and his work completed. There was still one thing he had to do, and that was permanently to do away with Thor by dropping the idol into the bottom of the dam. He still hadn't examined the god hidden under his sleeping pile. One evening, after returning from a solitary walk above the dam, he entered his shack and lit a torch, then almost dropped it from shock. His dwelling was a wreck. The place had been ransacked from top to bottom. His sleeping pile lay in the middle of the floor. The idol was gone. He turned and fled from the room, but before he could take a dozen steps towards the village, several shadows glided out from behind trees and rocks in the moonlight, resolving themselves into men. Before he could cry out or struggle, strong arms pinned his arms to his body, and someone clapped a dirty hand over his mouth. He was forced back into his hovel, and the door slammed shut. Standing in front of him was a very bedraggled figure whom he recognised as Thalgor. He also recognised his three other captors. All were elderly reactionaries of the tribe who had disapproved of him from the beginning. In spite of his predicament, Builder felt a warm glow of happiness course through him. If these were the only cronies Thalgor could round up, that meant the rest of the villagers were sympathetic with his cause. He suddenly became aware of Thalgor's grating voice. It took me a little time to piece things together, but once I did, it didn't take me long to come back and find the god where I might have first suspected it would be. Right here! For your sacrilege, you will pay with every last drop of blood you have in your scrawny old body. And now! Whereupon Thalgor disappeared out of the hovel. Somehow Builder had known they were going to kill him before arousing the rest of the tribe to the fact that Thor was back. Thalgor was taking no chances of his standing in the way of him or Thor ever again. But Builder didn't care. He had sown his few seeds of knowledge and wisdom well. Although Thalgor didn't know it, this time he wouldn't have complete homage from all the tribe. There would now be doubts and questionings and tests for both Thor and Thalgor in the ways of truth and righteousness. Then Thalgor returned to the shack with what Builder thought must be Thor. The hand over his mouth had twisted his head back so he only got a glimpse, but he didn't miss the long knife Thalgor pulled from beneath his tattered skins, nor the large sacrificial bowl one of the others held below his neck. Then his head was tilted forward and sidewise, and he got his first full look at the god Thor. At the sight, his whole body shook with smothered laughter. Below the two arms, an etched thunderbolt, were large block letters standing out in bold relief. Thor. Automatic dishwasher. Atomic powered. 1999. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. To Pay the Piper by James Blish Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, February 1956 Narrated by Tom Tudor the man in the white jacket stopped at the door marked Re-Education Project, Colonel H. H. Mudgett, Commanding Officer, and waited while the scanner looked him over. He had been through that door a thousand times, but the scanner made as elaborate a job of it as if it had never seen him before. It always did, for there was always in fact a chance that it had never seen him before, whatever the fallible human beings to whom it reported might think. It went over him from grey, crew-cut pull to reagent-proof shoes 
checking his small, wiry body and lean profile against its store silhouettes, tasting and smelling him as dubiously as if he were an orange held in storage two days too long. Name, it said at last. Carson, Samuel, 32454-0698. Business, Medical Director, Re-Ed 1. While Carson waited, a distant heavy concussion came rolling down upon him through the mile of solid granite about his head. At the same moment, the letters on the door, and everything else inside his cone of vision, blurred distressingly, and a stab of pure pain went lancing through his head. It was the supersonic component of the explosion, and it was harmless except that it always both hurt and scared him. The light on the door scanner, which had been glowing yellow up to now, flicked back to red again, and the machine began the whole routine all over. The sound bomb had reset it. Carson patiently endured its inspection, gave his name, serial number and mission once more, and this time got the green. He went in, unfolding as he walked the flimsy square of cheap paper he had been carrying all along. Mudgett looked up from his desk and said at once, What now? The physician tossed the square of paper down under Mudgett's eyes. Summary of the press reaction to Hamlin's speech last night, he said. The total effect is going against us, Colonel. Unless we can change Hamlin's mind, this outcry to re-educate civilians ahead of soldier is going to lose the war for us. The urge to live on the surface again has been mounting for ten years. Now it's got a target to focus on. Us. Mudgett chewed on a pencil while he read the summary. A blocky, bulky man, as short as Carson, and with hair as grey and close-cropped. A year ago... Carson would have told him that nobody in Riyadh could afford to put stray objects in his mouth even once, let alone as a habit. Now Carson just waited. There wasn't a man, or a woman, or a child, of America's surviving thirty-five million sane people who didn't have some such tick. Not now, not after twenty-five years of underground life. He knows it's impossible, doesn't he? Mudgett demanded abruptly. Of course he doesn't, Carson said impatiently. He doesn't know any more about the real nature of the project than the people do. He thinks the educating we do is in some sort of survival technique. That's what the papers think too, as you can plainly see by the way they loaded that editorial. Um, if we take indirect control of the papers in the first place... Carson said nothing. Military control of every facet of civilian life was a fact, and Mudgett knew it. He also knew that an appearance of freedom to think is a necessity for the human mind, and that the appearance could not be maintained without a few shreds of the actuality. Suppose we do this, Mudgett said at last. Hamlin's position in the State Department makes it impossible for us to muzzle him but it ought to be possible to explain to him that no unprotected human being can live on the surface, no matter how many merit badges he has for woodcraft and first aid. Maybe we could even take him on a little trip topside. I'll wager he's never seen it. And what if he dies up there? Carlson said stonily. We lose three-fifths of every topside party as it is, and Hamlin's an inexperienced might be the best thing, mightn't it? No, Carson said. It would look like we'd planned it that way. The papers would have the populace boiling by the next morning. Mudgett groaned and nibbled another double row of indentations around the barrel of the pencil. There must be something, he said. There is. Well? Bring the man here and show him just what we are doing. Re-educate him, if necessary. Once we told the newspapers that he'd taken the course, well, who knows? They just might resent it. 
abusing his clearance privileges and so on. We'd be violating our basic policy, Mudgett said slowly. Give the earth back to the men who fight for it. Still, the idea has some merits. Hamlin's out in the antechamber right now, Carlson said. Shall I bring him in? The radioactivity never did rise much beyond a mildly hazardous level, and that was only transient during the second week of the war, the week called the Death of Cities. The small shards of sanity retained by the high commands on both sides dictated avoiding weapons with a built-in backfire. No cobalt bombs were dropped, no territories permanently poisoned. Generals still remembered that unoccupied territory, no matter how devastated, is still unconquered territory. But no such consideration stood in the way of biological warfare. It was controllable. You never released against the enemy any disease you didn't yourself know how to control. There would be some slips, of course, but the margin for error there were some slips, but for the most part, biological warfare worked fine. The great fevers washed like tides around and around the globe, one after another. In such cities as had escaped the bombings, the rumble of truck convoys carrying the puffed, heaped corpses to the mass graves became the only sound except for sporadic small arms fire. And then that too ceased and the trucks stood rusting in rows. Nor were human beings the sole victims. Cattle fevers were sent out, wheat rusts, rice moulds, corn blights, hog choleras, poultry enteritises, fountained into the indifferent air from the hidden laboratories, or were loosed far aloft in the jet stream by rocketing fleets. Gelatin capsules pollulating with gill rots fell like hail into the great fishing grounds of Newfoundland, Oregon, Japan, Sweden, Portugal. Hundreds of species of animals were drafted as secondary hosts for human diseases, were injected and released to carry the blessings of the laboratories to their mates in litters. It was discovered that minute amounts of the tetracycline series of antibiotics which had long been used as feed supplements to bring farm animals to full market weight early, could also be used to raise the most whopping Anopheles and Aedes mosquitoes anybody ever saw, capable of flying long distances against the wind and of carrying a peculiarly interesting new strains of the malarial parasite and the yellow fever virus. By the time it had ended, Everyone who remained alive was a mile underground. For good. I still fail to understand why, Hamelin said, if, as you claim, you have methods of re-educating soldiers for surface life, you can't do so for civilians as well, or instead. The Undersecretary, a tall spare man, bald on top, and with a heavily creased forehead, spoke with an odd neutral accent, untinged by regionalism or the trained diplomat, despite the fact that there had been no such thing as a foreign service for nearly half a century. "'We're going to try to explain that to you,' Carson said. "'But we thought that, first of all, we try to explain once more why we think it would be a bad policy, as well as physically out of the question.' "'Sure.' Everybody wants to go topside as soon as possible. Even people who are reconciled to these endless caverns and corridors hope for something better for their children. A glimpse of sunlight, a little rain, the fall of a leaf. That's more important now to all of us than the war, which we don't believe in any longer. That doesn't even make any military sense, since we haven't the numerical strength to occupy the enemy's territory any more, and they haven't the strength to occupy ours. We understand all that, but we also know that the enemy is intent on prosecuting the war to the end, 
extermination is what they say they want on their propaganda broadcasts, and your own department reports that they seem to mean what they say. So we can't give up fighting them. That would be simple suicide. Are you still with me? Yes, but I don't see. Give me a moment more. If we have to continue to fight, we know this much, that the first of the two sides to get men on the surface again, so as to be able to attack important targets, not just keep them isolated in seas of plagues, will be the side that will bring this war to an end. They know that too. We have good reason to believe that they have a re-education project and is about as far advanced as ours is. Look at it this way, Colonel Mudgett burst in unexpectedly. What we have now is a stalemate. A saboteur occasionally locates one of the underground cities and lets the pestilence into it. Sometimes on our side, sometimes on theirs. But that only happens sporadically, and it's just more of this mutual extermination business, to which we committed willy-nilly for as long as they are. If we can get troops onto the surface first, we'll be able to scout out their important installations in short order and issue them a surrender ultimatum with teeth in it. They'll take it. The only other course is the sort of slow, mutual suicide we've got now. Hamlin put the tips of his fingers together. You gentlemen lecture me about policy as if I had never heard the word before. I'm familiar with your arguments for sending soldiers first. You assume that you're familiar with all of mine for starting with civilians, but you're wrong, because some of them haven't been brought up at all outside the department. I'm going to tell you some of them, and I think they'll merit your close attention. Carson shrugged. I like nothing better than to be convinced, Mr. Secretary. Go ahead. You of all people should know, Dr. Carson, how close are underground societies to a psychotic break. To take a single instance, the number of juvenile gangs roaming these corridors of ours has increased 400% since the rumours about the re-education project began to spread. Or another, the number of individual crimes without motive, crimes committed just to distract the committer from the grinding monotony of the life we all lead, has now passed the total of all other crimes put together. And as for actual insanity... Of our 35 million people still unhospitalized, there are 4 million cases of which we know, each one of which should be committed right now for early paranoid schizophrenia, except that were we to commit them, our essential industries would suffer a manpower loss more devastating than anything the enemy has inflicted upon us. Every one of those 4 million persons is a major hazard to his neighbors and to his job. But how can we do without them? And what can we do about the unrecognized subclinical cases, which probably total twice as many? How long can we continue operating without a collapse under such conditions? Carson mopped his brow. I didn't suspect that he had got that far. It has gone that far, Hamlin said icily, and it is accelerating. Your own project has helped to accelerate it. Colonel Mudgett here mentioned the opening of isolated cities to the pestilences. Shall I tell you how Louisville fell? A spy again, I suppose, Mudgett said. No, Colonel, not a spy. A band of, of vigilantes, of mutineers. I'm familiar with your slogan, The Earth to Those Who Fight for It. Do you know the counter-slogan that's circulating among the people? They waited. Hamlin smiled and said, Let's die on the surface. They overwhelmed the military detachment there, put the city administration to death, and blew open the shaft to the surface. About a thousand people actually made it to the top. Within twenty-four hours, the city was dead as the ringleaders had been warned would be the outcome. The warning didn't deter them, nor did it protect the prudent citizens who had no part in the affair. Hamlin leaned forward suddenly. People won't wait to be told when it's their turn to be re-educated. 
they'll be tired of waiting, tired to the point of insanity of living at the bottom of a hole. They'll just go. And that, gentlemen, will leave the world to the enemy, or more likely, the rats. They alone are immune to everything by now. There was a long silence. At last Carson said mildly, "'Why aren't we immune to everything by now?' "'Eh? Why? The new generations! They've never been exposed!' "'We still have a reservoir of older people who lived through the war, "'people who had one or several of the new diseases that swept the world, "'some as many as five, and yet recovered. "'They still have their immunities. We know. We've tested them.' We know from sampling that no new disease has been reintroduced by either side in over ten years now. Against all the known ones, we have immunization techniques, antisera, antibiotics, and so on. I suppose you get your shots every six months like all the rest of us. We should all be very hard to infect now, and such infections as do take should run mild courses. Carson held the Under Secretary's eyes grimly. Now answer me this question. Why is it that, despite all these protections, every single person in an open city dies? I don't know, Hamlin said, staring at each of them in turn. By your showing, some of them should recover. They should, Carson said, but nobody does. Why? because the very nature of disease has changed since we all went underground. There are now abroad in the world a number of mutated bacterial strains which can bypass the immunity mechanisms of the human body altogether. What this means, in simple terms, is that, should such a germ get into your body, your body wouldn't recognise it as an invader. It would manufacture no antibodies against the germ. Consequently, the germ could multiply without any check, and you would die. So would we all. I see, Hamlin said. He seemed to have recovered his composure extraordinarily rapidly. I am no scientist, gentlemen, but what you tell me makes our position sound perfectly hopeless. Yet, obviously, you have some answer. Carson nodded. We do. But it's important for you to understand the situation, otherwise the answer will mean nothing to you. So, is it perfectly clear to you now, from what we've said so far, that no amount of re-educating a man's brain, be he soldier or civilian, will allow him to survive on the surface? Quite clear, Hamlin said, apparently ungrudgingly. Carson's hopes rose by a fraction of a millimetre. "'But if you don't re-educate his brain, what can you re-educate? His reflexes, perhaps?' "'No,' Carson said. "'His lymph nodes and his spleen.' A scornful grin began to appear on Hamlin's thin lips. "'You need better public relations counsel than you have been getting,' he said. "'If what you say is true, as of course I assume it is, "'then the term re-educate is not only inappropriate, it's downright misleading. "'If you had chosen a less suggestive and more accurate label in the beginning, "'I wouldn't have been able to cause you half the trouble I have.' "'I agree that we were badly advised there,' Carson said but not entirely for those reasons. Of course the name is misleading. That's both a characteristic and a function of the names of top-secret projects. But in this instance, the name re-education, bad as it now appears, subjected the men who chose it to a fatal temptation. You see, though it is misleading, it is also entirely accurate. Word games... Hamlin said. Not at all, Mudgett interposed. We were going to spare you the theoretical reasoning behind our project, Mrs. Secretary, but now you'll just have to sit still for it. The fact is 
that the Buddha's ability to distinguish between his own cells and those of some foreign tissue, a skin graft, say, or a bacterial invasion of the blood, isn't an inherited ability. It's a learned reaction. Furthermore, if you'll think about it a moment, you'll see that it has to be. Body cells die, too, and have to be disposed of. What would happen if removing those dead cells provoked an antibody reaction, as a destruction of foreign cells does? We'd die of anaphylactic shock while we're still infants. For that reason, the body has to learn how to scavenge selectively. In human beings, that lesson isn't learned completely until about a month after birth. During the intervening time, the newborn infant is protected by antibodies that it gets from the colostrum, the first milk it gets from the breast during the three or four days immediately after birth. It can't generate its own. It isn't allowed to, so to speak, until it's learned the trick of cleaning up body residues without triggering the antibody mechanisms. Any dead cells marked personal have to be dealt with some other way. That seems clear enough, Hamlin said, but I don't see its relevance. Well, we're in a position now where that differentiation between the self and everything outside the body doesn't do us any good any more. These mutated bacteria have been selfed by the mutation. In other words, some of the protein molecules, probably deseroxybononucleic acid molecules, carry configurations or recognition units identical with those of our body cells, so that the body can't tell one from another. But what has all of this to do with re-education? Just this, Carlson said. What we do here is to impose upon the cells of the body, all of them, a new set of recognition units for the guidance of the lymph nodes and the spleen, which are the organs that produce antibodies. The new units are highly complex, and the chances of their being duplicated by bacterial evolution, even under forced draught, are too small to worry about. That's what re-education is. In a few moments, if you like, we'll show you just how it's done. Hamlin ground out his fifth cigarette in Mudgett's ashtray, and placed the tips of his fingers together thoughtfully. Carlson wondered just how much of the concept of recognition marking the undersecretary had absorbed. It had to be admitted that he was astonishingly quick to take hold of abstract ideas, but the self-marker theory of immunity was, like everything else in immunology, almost impossible to explain to laymen, no matter how intelligent. This process, Hamlin said hesitantly, it takes a long time, about six hours per subject, and we can handle only one man at a time. That means that we can count on putting no more than 7,000 troops into the field by the turn of the century. Every one will have to be a highly trained specialist if we're to bring the war to a quick conclusion. Which means no civilians, Hamlin said. I see. I'm not entirely convinced, but by all means... Let's see how it's done. Once inside, the undersecretary tried his best to look everywhere at once. The room cut into the rock was roughly two hundred feet high. Most of it was occupied by the bulk of the re-education monitor, a mechanism as tall as a fifteen-story building and about a city block square. Guards watched it on all sides, and the face of the machine swarmed with technicians. Incredible, Hamlin murmured. That enormous object can process only one man at a time? That's right, Mudgett said. Luckily, it doesn't have to treat all the body cells directly. It works through the blood, reselfing the cells by means of small changes in the serum chemistry. What kind of changes? Well, Carson said, choosing each word carefully, that's more or less a graveyard secret, Mr. Secretary. We can tell you this much. The machine uses a vast array of crystalline complex sugars which behave 
rather like the blood group and type proteins. They fed into the serum in minute amounts and a feedback control of second-by-second -second analysis of the blood. The computations involved in deciding upon the amount and the precise nature of each introduced chemical are highly complex, hence the size of the machine. It is, in its major effect, an artificial kidney. I've seen artificial kidneys in the hospitals, Hamlin said, frowning. They're rather compact affairs. Because all they do is remove waste products from the patient's blood and restore the fluid and electrolyte balance. Those are very minor renal functions in the higher mammals. The organ's main duty is chemical control of immunity. If Burnett and Fenner had known that back in 1949, when the selfing theory was being formulated, we'd have had re-education long before now. Most of the machine size is due to the computation section, Mudgett emphasised. In the body, the brainstem does those computations, as part of maintaining homeostasis. But we can't reach the brainstem from outside. It's not under conscious control. Once the body is re-selfed, it will retrain the thalamus where we can't. Suddenly, two swinging doors at the base of the machine were pushed apart and a mobile operating table came through, guided by two attendants. There was a form on it, covered to the chin with a sheet. The face above the sheet was immobile and almost as white. Hamlin watched the table go out of the huge cavern with visibly mixed emotions. He said, this process? It's painful? No, not exactly, Carson said. The motive behind the question interested him hugely, but he didn't dare show it. But any fooling around with the immunity mechanisms can give rise to symptoms, fever, general malaise, and so on. We try to protect our subjects by giving them a light shock anaesthesia first. Shock? Hamlin repeated. You mean electroshock? I don't see how. Call it stress anaesthesia instead. We give the man a steroid drug that counterfeits the anaesthesia the body itself produces in moments of great stress, on the battlefield, say, or just after a serious injury. It's fast and free of after-effects. There's no secret about that, by the way. The drug involved is 21 hydroxypregnane 3 20 dione sodium succinate, and it dates all the way back to 1955. Oh, the Under Secretary said. The ringing sound of the chemical name he had had, as Carson had hoped, a ritually soothing effect. Gentlemen, Hamlin said hesitantly. Gentlemen, I have a, a rather unusual request. And, I am afraid, a rather selfish one. A brief, nervous laugh. Selfish in both senses, if you will pardon me the pun. You need feel no hesitation in refusing me, but... Abruptly he appeared to find it impossible to go on. Carson mentally crossed his fingers and plunged in. You would like to undergo the process yourself, he said. Well, yes. Yes, that's exactly it. Does that seem inconsistent? I should know, should I not, what it is that I'm advocating for my following? Know it intimately, from personal experience, not just theory. Of course I realise that it would conflict with your policy, but I assure you I wouldn't try to turn it to any political advantage. None whatsoever and perhaps it wouldn't be too great a lapse of policy to process just one civilian among your seven thousand soldiers. Subverted by God! Carson looked at Mudgett with a firmly straight face. It wouldn't do to accept too quickly. But Hamlin was rushing on, almost chattering now. I can understand your hesitation. You must feel that I'm trying to gain some advantage— or even to get to the surface ahead of my fellow men. If it will set your minds at rest, I would be glad to enlist in your advance army. Before five years are up, 
I could surely learn some technical skill which would make me useful to the expedition. If you would prepare papers to that effect, I'd be happy to sign them. That's hardly necessary, Mudgett said. After you're re-educated, we can simply announce the fact and say that you're agreed to join the advance party when the time comes. Ah, Hamlin said, I see the difficulty. Now that would make my position quite impossible. If there is no other way— Excuse us a moment, Carson said. Hamlin bowed, and the doctor pulled Mudgett off out of earshot. Don't overplay it, he murmured. You're tipping our hand with that talk about a press release, Colonel. He's offering us a bribe, but he's plenty smart enough to see that the price you're suggesting is that of his whole political career. He won't pay that much. What then? Mudgett whispered hoarsely. Get somebody to prepare the kind of informal contract he suggested. Offer to put it under security seal so he won't be able to show it to the press at all. He'll know well enough that such a seal can be broken if a policy ever comes before a presidential review, and that will restrain him from forcing such a review. Let's not demand too much. Once he's been re-educated, he'll have to live the rest of the five years with the knowledge that he can live topside any time he wants to try it, and he hasn't had the discipline our men have had. It's my bet that he'll goof off before the five years are up and good riddance. They went back to Hamlin, who was watching the machine and humming in a painfully abstracted manner. I've convinced the Colonel, Carson said, that your services in the army might well be very valuable when the time comes, Mr. Secretary. If you'll sign up, we'll put the papers under security seal for your own protection, and then I think we can fit you into our treatment program today. I'm grateful to you, Dr. Carson, Hamlin said. Very grateful indeed. Five minutes after his injection, Hamlin was as peaceful as a flounder and was rolled through the swinging doors. An hour's discussion of the probable outcome, carried on in the privacy of Mudger's office, bore very little additional fruit, however. It's our only course, Carson said. It's what we hope to gain from his visit, duly modified by circumstances. It all comes down to this. Hamlin's compromised himself, and he knows it. But, Mudgett said, suppose he was right. What about all that talk of him about mass insanity? I'm sure it's true, Carlson said, his voice trembling slightly despite his best efforts at control. It's going to be rougher than ever down here for the next five years, Colonel. Our only consolation is that the enemy must have exactly the same problem, and if we can beat them to the surface... St! Mudgett said. Carson had already broken off his sentence. He wondered why the scanner gave man such a hard time outside that door, then admitted him without any warning to the people on the other side. Couldn't the damn thing be trained to knock? The newcomer was a page from the hematology section. Here's the preliminary rundown on your student X, Dr. Carson, he said. The page saluted Mudgett and went out. Carson began to read. After a moment, he also began to sweat. Colonel, look at this. I was wrong after all disastrously wrong. I haven't seen a blood type distribution pattern like Hamlin's since I was a medical student, and even back then it was only a demonstration, not a real live patient. Look at it from the genetic point of view, the migration factors. He passed the protocol across the desk. Mudgett was not by background a scientist, but he was an enormously able administrator of the breed that makes it his business to know the de technicalities of which any project ultimately rests. He was not much more than halfway through the tally before his eyebrows were gaining altitude like shockwaves. Carson, we can't let that man into the machine. He's... He's already in it, Colonel, you know that. And if we interrupt the process before it runs to term, we'll kill him. 
Let's kill him, then, Mudget said harshly. Say he died while being processed. Do the country a favour. That would produce a hell of a stink. Besides, we have no proof. Mudget flourished the protocol excitedly. That's not proof to anyone but a hematologist. But Carson, the man's a saboteur, Mudget shouted. Nobody but an Asiatic would have a typing pattern like this. And he's no melting pot product either. He's a classical mixture, very probably a Georgian. And every move he's made since we first heard of him has been aimed directly at us. Aimed directly at tricking us into getting him into the machine. I think so too, Carlson said grimly. I just hope the enemy hasn't many more agents as brilliant. One's enough, Mudget said. He's sure to be loaded to the latest cc of his blood with catalyst poisons. Once the machine starts processing his serum, we're done for. It'll take us years to reprogram the computer, if it can be done at all. It's got to be stopped. Stopped, Carson said, astonished. But it's already stopped. That's not what worries me. The machine stopped it fifty minutes ago. It can't have. How could it? It has no relevant data. Sure it has, Carson leaned forward, took the cruelly chewed pencil away from Mudget, and made a neat check beside one of the entries on the protocol. Mudget stared at the checked item. Platelets re six, he mumbled. But what's that got to do with Oh Oh I see. That platelet type doesn't exist at all in our population now, does it? Never seen it before myself, at least. No, Carson said, grinning wolfishly. It never was common in the West, and the pogrom of 1981 wiped it out. That's something the enemy couldn't know. But the machine knows it. As soon as it gives him the standard anti-EV desensitization shot, his platelets will begin to dissolve, and he'll be rejected for incipient thrombocytopenia. He laughed. For his own protection. But... But he's getting nitrous oxide in the machine, and he'll be held six hours under anesthesia anyhow, also for his own protection. Mudget broke in. He was grinning back at Carson like an idiot. When he comes out from under, he'll assume that he's been re-educated, and he'll beat it back to the enemy to report that he's poisoned our machine, so that they can be sure they'll beat us to the surface. And he'll go the fastest way, over land. He will, Carson agreed. Of course he'll go over land, and of course he'll die. But where does that leave us? We won't be able to conceal that he was treated here, if there's any sort of an inquiry at all. And his death will make everything we do here look like a fraud, instead of paying our Pied Piper. And great jumping Jehoshaphat, look at his name. They were rubbing our noses in it all the time. Nevertheless, we didn't pay the Piper. We killed him. And plateless Ra-6 won't be an adequate excuse for the press. Or for Hamlin's follow. It doesn't worry me, Mudget rumbled. Who'll know? He won't die in our labs. He'll leave here hale and hearty. He won't die until he drinks a break for the surface. After that, we can compose a fine obituary for the press. Heroic government official, on the highest policy level, couldn't wait to lead his followers to the surface. Died of being too much in a hurry. Re-Ed Project sorrowfully reminds everyone that no technique is foolproof. Mudget paused long enough to light a cigarette, which was most a singular action for a man who never smoked. As a matter of fact, Carson, he said, it's a natural. Carson considered it. It seemed to hold up. And Hamlin would have a death certificate as complex as he deserved. Not officially, of course, but in the minds of everyone who knew the facts. His death, when it came, 
would be due directly to the thrombocytopenia which had caused the Ried machine to reject him. And thrombocytopenia is a disease of infants. Unless ye become as little children. That was a fitting reason for rejection from the new kingdom of earth, anemia of the newborn. His pent breath went out of him in a long sigh. He hadn't been aware that he'd been holding it. It's true, he said softly. That's the time to pay the piper. When? Mudget said. When? Carson said, surprised. Why? Before he takes the children away. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. In His Image by Bryce Walton Originally published in Planet Stories, Winter 1948. Narrated by Tom Trissel. Towering and invulnerable, they stood on the hills patiently awaiting their master. Meanwhile, they slew the vermin crawling below. John ran down that long corridor and into the old man's room. He was breathless as he threw himself on his face beneath the old man's chair made from gypsum. A kind of savage eagerness lighted his face, but the old man's face, a frozen pallid ball crinkled into a million lines, was sad and hopelessly resigned. "'I seen him!' John cried. "'I seen him!' His unhealthily pallid body, though big and raw-boned, was slender and writhed with a leathery strength that comes with constant effort and exercise rather than diet and sun. The old man shrugged. His voice was a hoarse whisper in that one cavern among the hundred and fifty miles of corridors, interlocking levels and rivers that made up the underground hideaway. So you seen him, John. Many have seen the mechs. The mechs might have seen you too. If they ever find us here, well, they'd probe us out like we were grubs. And they'd burn us with those red ray eyes. Why'd you go up top? You know it's against the rules. John got up. His chest heaved. His eyes were polished beads in the thick nest of reddish beard. Because I don't like living in this cave like a grub. I've been up twice, and now I can't stay down here any more. Nobody else has got guts enough to go up. So let them stay down here and rot. But I'm going back up on top, Chief, and I'm staying up there. The old man leaned back. He couldn't hide the gleam of gruff respect in his eyes. Go ahead, John, but don't come back down. Once they get on your tail, you can't shake them, and you'd lead them right back here, and then they'd get the rest of us. As far as I know, John, we are the only humans left. John's hands clenched. And some of all of us be dead too, living down here in this cave where there ain't never no sun, eating lizards and snakes, and dying off one by one anyway. We're all going to be dead in another year. What's so great about spending that year crawling and grubbing down here? Scared to even take one last look at the sun? It's not for me, Chief. I'm leaving. The old man shrugged again. Go ahead, I said. Just promise not to ever come back and lead them down here. You'll promise that, John. Something thickened in his throat, but he managed to say yes. He turned, then twisted back toward the old man. You're smart, he said. You're supposed to know about when they took over. I've asked others. No one seems to know, and they care less. Would you tell me, Chief, what are they, the mechs? The old man's voice echoed strangely against the surrounding grotesque bars of limestone stalactites and stalagmites in multicurled hues of fusing reds and orange, purple and browns. A pinched face peered at them from beneath the ancient bars, then withdrew its tired eyes. "'Maybe there's fifty humans left down here in Mammoth Owl,' the old man said softly. "'Maybe there ain't nobody else left in the world. Just them, with their silent machinery driving over the wastes, and their red deaf eyes sleeping in the dark, grabbing for us. The big war went on and on, nobody knows how long. But humans couldn't fight it. 
too much deadly radiation, so they made machines to go fight for them. The sky and the land were just masses of machines, throwing out clouds and streamers and explosions. The land became nothing but pools and seas of deadly dust and fire. The sky was clouded with it, and people went underground. They had to go down deep, and they couldn't come back up, what was left of them, for hundreds of years and more. The old man was gazing with a distant, haunted expression at the small blind lizard crawling up the painted wall. John listened. His skin was cold. A shiver ran down his back. Then they started grubbing the humans out and killing them. I don't suppose anyone knows how long it's been since they took over. That's wrong. I wasn't around then, nor my father, nor my father's father's father. It was long, long before that. It was so long ago that... The old man's eyes widened, his voice choked off with a cloud of unconscious fear that had slipped through. "'They're godly,' he whispered. "'You've seen them. They're all shapes and angles and cubes and small smooth th running things. They all shine like metal, and I guess they are metal. Nobody knows what they are. I heard tell, when I was a boy, that they were just machines, machines built by humans a long time before.' and that somehow or other the hard radiation had put a spark in them that made them able to think and move around and organise like humans used to do. But I reckon they're more intelligent than any humans ever were. John backed away. Sweat popped out on coldly on his face and chest. I seen him, he choked. I sneaked on top. I went down to Rivet River. It took me hours to get used to the sun. I waited until the sun started going down. Then I sneaked out and looked down the big hill that goes down into the valley. I seen two of them. They must have been a hundred foot high. They were smooth. They had long snaking arms and single eyes that shot out red beams like fire. They stood on top of the hill against the sun. The sun was red all round them. They looked like they were made of metal all right, chief. But how can they move by themselves and, and think if they're metal? The old man sighed. Ow! He peered at John with tired, retreating eyes. "'What is thought?' he said then. "'What was life ever? Floods of gamma rays bathed them for centuries, and then they were living, and they had thoughts of their own. Humans never got a chance to find out what life was before he took it away from himself. He took it and gave it. To them!' The old man dropped his face in his shaking hands. John had never heard a man crying before. He backed away slowly and turned and ran out of the great cavern. A grey dusky afternoon was dying when John crawled out of the small hall between rocks and started writhing down the hill. His eyes stayed open in fearful wonderment until tears rolled down his cheeks. The soft greens and browns of the great forest that thinned up into the hills. There was not the slightest hint that beneath this vast silent beauty stretched the enormous grotesque underworld of Mammoth Hole nor that in those nameless caverns and corridors along the cold and rushing and naked rivers a few unkempt savages clung to dim memories of centuries lost power and surface civilization. John stopped, an intangible yet powerful emotion surging him. I'm crawling, he gritted as he sat up. I said I was sick and crawling. I ain't a grub. I'm not crawling any more. Not for them damn machines, not for anything. They can't do nothing but kill you and watch life down in that owl. He stood up. He stood up straight and started walking down the rocky trail and finally along the smooth greenless beside the river. His strides were long and unhesitating, but inside him was a deep, growing horror as he remembered those shiny silver giants that had stood so silently on the hill against the red sunset. The huge, attentive, waiting stillness, and the sudden, terrible sweep of the red-beamed eye and the reaching of the metal arms. He stopped and looked down at his thin white legs, starved of the sun, knotted and scarred from crawling over the harsh underground paths. He looked at his gnarled, pallid fingers, quivering in the cold. He looked up at the sky. A few stars were showing dimly, palely. Oh, God! Give me a quick ending when my time comes, that's all I ask. 
Don't let me crawl any more on my belly. Give me the guts to keep walking straight up, like I'm walking now. There was no answer. There was no sound except the cry of birds in the forest, the drone of insects and other louder noises from the river. He was alone. He walked faster. But he soon tired, because he had never walked far at a time. Underground, people crawled a lot of the time through narrow holes, and under there no one would walk far unless they went in circles. He sat down to rest beneath a canopy of stars. He lay back and looked up at them, a feeling of frightful awe pressing down upon him. The night around him was colder now, and the sounds of the night had risen to a hungry song. And then he rolled over with a quick, terrible cry, leapt crouching to his feet. There were at least a dozen of them, great, shiny, angular, and cubed monsters sliding noiseless down the hill. A peculiar bluish radiance pushed out around them, bathing the surrounding night in a deadly-seeming pall. With a pathetic defiance, John picked up the heavy stone, stood with his legs wide apart, holding the rock in front of him. Every nerve in him shrieked, pulling his muscles away, but he couldn't run. He couldn't run nor crawl any more. A kind of dark, resigned courage replaced the first impulses of flight, and he hurled the rock. There was a futile thud, and the rock bounded from the great unruffled wall of metal. Then, for an instant, he didn't think the thoughts, the voices, were anything but his own, strange, alien, terrifying, inspired by his own fears. And then he realised it was the mechs. A grab! Yes, I thought they were all gone. No, there are some remaining deep in the soil. Central File says they are no longer of any danger, but File also retains orders to kill all organic things. John moved toward them. He moved stiffly, a strange and intangible bulwark of purpose shielding him from the screaming horror. Something of the awful indignity of his position shook him, sent a hot rage throbbing blindly past his temples. He heard his breath coming hard from tightened throat. These great nameless things, machines, intelligent metal, it didn't matter what. They had no idea of what he was, that he had a brain, that he could think, and yet their gigantic thoughts were plain to him. Some time, some time so very long ago, he, his kind, humans, had made these things had built them up from molten stuff, had put intricate interlocking machinery within them so that they could move, think for themselves, repair themselves. And then, humans had launched the big war, had released seething seas of basic energy, and somehow these gigantic shiny silvery things had begun to live. But to them, John, a human, a descendant of the humans that had made them and had given them life, was less than the dirt under their towering, invulnerable radiance, less than the dust beneath their sweeping red death eyes. They had no conception that it was anything but a pale, crawling cave worm. John walked closer. He was not so much afraid for himself now. There was more of a sweeping terror of the whole situation, the terrible futility and irony. He wasn't afraid to die, and he knew that he had to die now, that there was no escape, no defiance. He shook his fist at the silent, towering forms. Damn you, it's me, man, man, I'm human, I'm not crawling, see, I'm not crawling, I'm talking to you, I'm talking, I'm thinking too, see. It's making noises. Yes, all the various species of organic life make noises peculiar to their type. Have you not seen a grub before? No, let us kill it now. We must report back to Central File. How long will it take to kill all organic life? Central File said it will take many more years, even though now most organic life has been destroyed. We must complete the task soon, you know. Man will return. Glorious man-god. Mighty man-god. Man-god the creator. Man-god the eternal. Ah, yes, mighty man-god. How long will it be before the man-god's coming? John shivered, reached out a shaking hand as though to support himself against the air. He tried to speak, but his facial muscles seemed frozen. He wanted to say, I'm man, 
I'm your creator. I made you long ago. But he could say nothing, nothing at all. That is not known. Man God made us in his own image, then departed, promising to return, return to bring us glory and eternity. May the great man God who created us from the lifeless stuff of the dirt return soon, for only then may our destiny be fulfilled. Yes, may man God return soon. Meanwhile, Central File demands immediate action in preparation for that day. Kill this grub. Soon all organic life that stands in the way of the man God's coming will be eradicated. The thunderous impact of telepathic power roared in John's head as he staggered forward, fists clenched. For the great man God, for whom we wait. John laughed. Hot tears scalded his face as he laughed. He was still laughing as the red death eye brightened, leapt out, and silently swept him away. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!